All righty. So I've decided to do uh, half hour sessions. Now, I'm not going to write them out because uh, I'd rather put in some time on the spot thinking about where we are in our development. And um, you can just pause the video. Work right along with me. All right, so the first thing we're going to cover is the trapezoidal rule. I'm doing so because it's so closely aligned with left hand and right hand uh, Riemann sums that there's only two little changes. So if you can do a left hand and a right hand, probably after this explanation, you can do a trapezoidal. So let's get a function in question. Easiest to work with uh, positive functions. So we'll work with the square root of x. So f of x, square root of x. I'm not going to draw this to scale. We're going to say we're at 5. We're going to go to uh, 7. And we're going to do three trapezoids. So there's breaking this up into three equal parts. They don't have to be equal parts. Um, but I'll do so for the time being. Uh, so if we have three trapezoids, then we want to find the width of one of them. And the way you do that is to take the entire uh, period, it's not period, but the interval, the entire interval, and divide it up into the number of sections you want. And so each width is two thirds. And the trapezoidal rule is all about the width divided by two times something. So we got to divide this by two. And dividing that by two gives us one third, so there's a little pattern there, right? If you had a fraction that was not even and you divided by two, so let's say you had five sevenths and you want to divide that by two, well, that's five fourteenths. So there's a quick way to do that, obviously. All right, and you can see all of that. So I've got the video pinned properly. All right, so trapezoids, the first trapezoid and the second trapezoid, <laughs> put that as a subscript, not a division. First and second trapezoid actually share the altitude in the middle and the trapezoid, the third one, shares that. Whereas the ones on the outside, we only use once. So again, we've got to find these X values. Those X values have to be determined. And we know we have three and the width is two thirds. So I'm going to add two thirds to five to get to that one. So it's nice if you change everything into thirds, All right? So five is 15 thirds. So oh, not adding that's 17 thirds. That's 19 thirds and seven is indeed 21 thirds. It's nice to do that because then you know you haven't made any mistakes. So width, two thirds divided by two, one third. So the width divided by two is how we start this. And then we're gonna use this altitude once. Now the hardest part of this is naming that height. And that height is determined by this calculation. So it's really the square root of five. That's what that height is. The next one is square root of 17 thirds, but we're using it twice. Two times the square root of 17 over three, Two times the square root of 19 over three. I've got to make sure that the three is inside the square root. And then the last one is the square root of seven. And that's all you have to write for me on tests. But I will acknowledge right now, there'll be a trapezoidal rule on every test the rest of the term. There will be a left or a right hand rectangle approximation rest of the term. Now, if you're having trouble with left or right hand rectangles and you're in a small group and somebody in your group is doing well, it's on you to ask that person in class, hey, can you spend 10 minutes with me tonight and show me how to do that? Or you got to go to YouTube videos. There are hundreds of them out there. Trapezoidal rule. Teachers all over the country doing what I just did. Okay, it's not hard to find. You just type trapezoidal rule, YouTube video, and you got practice. But it's going to be on every test. And I guess if there's concern for me, about whether somebody has that or not. I know if you have it or not. I can see you work in class. You, on, in remote world, I don't have my eyes on you. I wish I did. So you got to take extra measures here. You got to meet me halfway and say, hey, Mr. V, can you spend a little extra time with me on that? Um, math help Mondays and Wednesday nights. Uh, I'm there at seven o'clock. People don't generally come in. The only two people that come in, Jake Nevins and Aaron Burstein, come religiously and, and make more gains by coming in. So I hope more people join that posse and that pod. Got to get 
politically correct language now. Uh, so definitely, uh, if you're in Remoteville and you're feeling like overwhelmed, well, the only way we're going to learn this is to talk about it over the length of the semester or trimester. So that's why I'm throwing it at you early. All right. So what's next? Let's get another problem here. How about we uh, take a look at uh, a quick limit? So I'm doing a half an hour. So I started at 930 at 10 o'clock. I'm done. So let's take a little limit problem here. Let's look at the limit as x goes to infinity. Of How about we do uh, 2x minus 7 over 3x plus 5? Okay. Now, some of you know what that answer is in five seconds or less. But let's, uh, let's do a little critical thinking here. Let's think about it on a deeper level. So we have this graph. 3x plus 5, and we have 2x minus 7. Got a graph going up 2 to 1. Uh, I got a graph going up at 3 to 1, I guess is what I've got. And I'm dividing uh, the 2 to 1 into the 3 to 1, and I'm moving to infinity. Now, moving to infinity means backing up. Backing up. Keep, well, let's back up. I, don't, I can't walk well enough to take this back. Back up, back up, back up. If you kept doing that until you got to Tron, that's the direction I'm looking, Tron. You wouldn't see these distances. You wouldn't see that. All you would see is a graph. I'm going to make it three to two. It's going to look easier to, easier to understand. I'm going to look at three to two. All you would see from a distance is something going up at three to one. So let's say that that's three to one. And then something going up at two to one. Now let's go to infinity. Let's go to infinity. And let's divide the 3 to 1 by the 2 to 1. Let's divide the 3 to 1 by the 2 to 1. Let's divide the 3 to 1 by the 2 to 1. Let's divide the 3 to 1 by the 2 to 1. I hope you see the picture's not changing, that there is a ratio there. What is that ratio? It's 3 to 2. And that's the answer to this problem. Okay? And you could always do it by checking some numbers. Put a million in here. You would have 3 million minus seven divided by two million plus five, and think about what that's really close to. Okay, that's really close to a, a three to two. Okay, so that's the numerical analysis, that's the graphical analysis, and this is all about the trend in a table. So the trend in a table, as X's get bigger, 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 bit bigger, my fraction is headed towards three to two. Okay, so we have limits on every test. Uh-huh. So I'll tackle another problem here. How about we find the point of inflection? Point of inflection of y equals, how about we do uh, 2x cubed minus uh, 12x squared plus x minus 8. All right, and I've been asking you to get a little sense of the graph. Uh, what I do know, and remember, you're pausing. I do know that 0, negative 8, I'm not drawing axes anymore. They get in the way. 0, negative 8 is the y-intercept that I'm going up 1 to 1, over 1 up. So there we go. So there's 0, negative 8. And at an instant, at an instant, I'm going up at 1 to 1. This is definitely going to make it, whew, that's definitely going to swing it in the other direction. Okay, so I got a cubic that looks like that. We're after the point of inflection. We know minus b over 3a is the shortcut, so I know it's going to happen at 2. Okay, and uh, my y value, I'm guessing, is much lower than negative 8. All right, so how do we do it with calculus? Well, we get our first derivative, 6x squared minus 24x plus 1. And then we get our second derivative, which is 12x minus 24. We set it to 0. 12x minus 24 from a graphical standpoint looks like that. We get a sign change of 2, negative to positive. What does the second derivative tell us? It tells us concave down to concave up, and the switch happens at 2. And so then we put 2 back into the equation, and we should get a 3 to 1 ratio here, opposite. If we don't, we made a mistake. So 27 times 2 is 54, so this is 3 times that. Without looking, this is 162, and it's going to be opposite. You take time to figure that out. And then we add uh, 2, and we subtract 8. 
If we do that, we're going to get twice that when I add that with this. I'm going to get minus 108, twice that opposite, plus 2, minus 8, is minus 6. I'm going to drop another 6, so it should be minus 114, I believe. Okay, now I'm doing that pretty quickly, uh, but you're taking more time, and if I made a mistake, let me know. So that's the point of inflection. All right, so now let's take a look at average rate of change. Average rate of change of x squared from negative one to five. So we want the average rate of change of x squared for the interval negative one to five. Okay, so we got ourselves negative one, gets us negative one, positive, excuse me, squaring gets us positive one, and five gets us 25. Boom, bitty, boom, bitty, boom, bitty, boom, bitty, boom. What's the slope of that? Whatever the slope of that secant line is, that's the answer to this question. Boom, 25. From one to 25 is 24 units of Y change. Negative one to five is six units. So it looks like negative four, I'm sorry, positive four. Doing a lot of math already today. Positive four is the answer to that question. Now, this is gonna morph into another question. What's the average? When is the average rate of change equal to an instantaneous rate of change? And that has a name in calculus. It's called the average value theorem. The average value theorem for derivatives. There's actually one for integrals. But right now, we're just looking at the one for derivatives. And so that's a fancy term, the mean, oh, I said average, right? Because in calculus, we don't say things unless we give it a little flair, a little arrogance. So it's not called the average value theorem, it's called the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem for derivatives. So when I write, find the MBTD, which I don't think I'm gonna to write too much anymore because I kind of like doing it by video gets me off the darn computer with the keyboard and everything else. So mean value theorem for derivatives is basically saying that somewhere on this interval, I gotta be going up at four to one. At some instant, I'm going up four to one. And how do we find that instant? How do we find rates of change at an instant? I hope your brain just said, take a derivative write a calculation that tells us the rates of change of this function. And what is the rate of change of this function? It's 2x, right? So when does 2x equal 4? At 2. Right there, I should be going up at the same rate. At 2, my rate is also 4. That's the slope of that tangent line. And you'll notice it's parallel. All right. So we just got ourselves, the fact that we could do a derivative allowed us to do a new type of calculation. Now, what that calculation is finding is the following. If I drove to Boston, which is 90 miles away from here, and it took me two hours, then my average rate of change is 45 miles an hour. That should sound familiar. I think we had the exact same discussion a week ago about average rate of change. So I would, on average, travel 45 miles an hour. What that means, the mean value theorem for derivatives, means that somewhere on the trip, my car read 45 miles an hour. Because if it never got up to 45 miles an hour, if I always went less than 45 miles an hour, I never got to Boston. And if it was always more than 45 miles an hour, I went well past Boston. All right, so there has to be at least one time. And I'll bet you, driving to Boston, there were a lot of times that my speedometer would read 45 miles an hour. Once I hit route two, I'm gonna, you know, go from a stop sign up to 55. It's gotta hit 45. There's gonna be some traffic near Boston, pulling out of the parking. You know, I'm gonna hit 45 lots. So it doesn't mean there's not just, that there's just one. There could be many, but there has to be at least one. Okay, so we got a new topic that will be on every test. And we won't test till next week, maybe Tuesday. And that'll be a scrimmage. Your first chance to see how many problems you got right. Okay? And then your challenge in this class is figure out what you got wrong 
and don't get it wrong again. All right, so that's that problem. So every time I hit something with a little meat, then I want to do something that's, you know, 10 second question, hopefully a 10 second question down the road. All right, so let's look at uh, integrate. Oh, different color, hope you can see that. Not well. So I'm gonna go back to the black. I get my marker here. Keeping an eye on things, we've been at about 15 minutes. It's 14 to be exact, I believe. Uh, we're gonna go another 16. So just integrate 5x squared dx. Okay, for some of you, that is now a five second question. Others may take longer. All right, so how do we do it? Well, we take the function and we add one to the exponent and divide by that exponent. And we add c. So what was the answer to that problem? Two plus one is three, five x to the three, divided by three. How do you check plus c? Right. So let's take the derivative. This is big F. This was little f. Let's check and see if it works. What's little f? Oh, three times this. I guess the threes cancel. Or go down one. Oh, yay. Yay. And the derivative of c is zero. Right? It doesn't change. All right. So I guess we did that right. All right. Let's do another one. Let's do the square root of x dx. I'll give you a chance. Pause the video. Oh, well. There's another way to write that. Another way to write that is x to the minus one half. That's your foundation work from your last class. So how do we do this? Same way we did the last one. We do x to the minus one half plus one, which is two over two, and we divide by that, which is dividing by one half. So what does that equal? Two x to the one half plus c. That's the mechanics. So a big important concept in math, when you've got something, you're not sure how to deal with it, can you think of writing it in a different way so you can deal with it? It's called substitution. All right, big concept in math. All right, so now what are we gonna do? We're gonna do the product rule. All right, so let's say we have y equals e to the x, uh, times the sine of x. Okay, e to the x times the sine of x. Okay, so you did a video last night. Hope you can do this. So what's y prime? Take the derivative of the first. What's the derivative of e to the x? It is e to the x times the second factor, and then add the derivative of the sine function is the cosine function times the original function, e to the x. Okay, let's do it one more time, something else. Let's do x cubed times the cosine of x. What is y prime? The derivative of the first factor, 3x squared, times, leave the second one alone, plus the derivative of the second, which happens to be minus sine x. So instead of plus, I'll write minus sine x times the first one, leave it alone. Okay, so there we have that one. That's the product rule. It gets a little more complicated when we do the chain rule, which I think I will lay out for you as a half hour video tonight. It is so important to learn the chain rule that I think I'll devote the entire half hour video that you'll look at tomorrow um, when I uh, upload it. Uh, and I think I'll create it tonight or this afternoon. Okay, chain rule is most important. All right, so now let's do an uh, actual integral. Let's do 3 to 4, 3x squared dx. Okay, let's actually do it. what's called a definite integral. See if you can do that. Well, first you got to do the operation, adding up all the layers, all the 3x squared layers, uh, and that is 3x squared. Add one and divide by that. Okay, so let's clean that up. That's x cubed. And we are looking at the x cubed table at 3 and at 4. 3 cubed is 27. 4 cubed is 64. You are looking at the x cubed function. 
and you are looking at the net change, the net change in the Y values from three to four. So from three to four, my Y values change from 27 to 64. How do we record that change? Well, first off, we write this, and then we do parentheses minus parentheses. When I drop a four in, I get 64. When I drop a three in, I get 27. So what was the net change? Uh, 34 plus three, I believe that's 37. Hopefully I didn't just make a math error. Now, what happened conceptually? Let's see if I've got my, hope I didn't lose it. There we have it. You started with a three by three cube. And here's that slotting process again. I'm adding volume. I'm adding volume. What's the volume here? One square, two squares, three square areas. Three square areas with a little bit of what? Thumb to finger, thumb to finger dimension right there. A small sliver of change. That's what that represents. And if I kept slotting, and I'll do this numerically for you soon. Keep slotting and slotting and slotting, then this box is going to go from a three by three by three to a, let's see if I can, to a four by four by four. Pretend that there's volume here that's covered in. All right, that's what's going on conceptually, geometrically. All right, and to understand calculus, I think you have to understand the geometric progression of it. Okay, so that's that problem. Wonder how many of these things you can do? I don't know. Here's a five second question for you from your last class. Limit as X goes to infinity of X squared plus four X minus seven over uh, X cubed plus eight X squared minus nine X plus 10. What's your answer from your last class? I hope you said zero. Reason being, if I put a million in here, if I put a million in here, and a million in here, my denominator is so much bigger than my numerator that that fraction is really, really small. If you didn't get that from your last class, come to Math Help, we'll analyze it numerically, talk about it a little less quickly, okay? But prerequisite is that you already have that coming in. Ah. All right, so let's take a derivative. Y equals the cube root of X plus seven minus 11 X plus four X to the three halves. You can pause it, do it. All right, we're just gonna do it. So I'm gonna rename X cube root of X as X to the one third. So what's Y prime? One third X to the subtracting one is subtracting three thirds. If I subtract three thirds, negative two thirds. The derivative of a constant is zero. The derivative of a linear function is the slope because it's constant. And multiplying by three halves, 12 divided by two is six. X subtracting one gets me one half. So that's taking derivative. I should have thrown the sine and the cosine in there, e to the x in there. Anyway, I didn't. All right, oh, let's do the same thing. Let's integrate. Let's do the cube root of X plus seven minus 11 X plus four X to the three halves. Little integration process. So what does that mean? That means I am integrating. So let's call this function, let's call it little f and then let's get our big F. Okay, so that means I'm gonna integrate a little bit of Thumb to finger change, hard to draw the geometry of that shape. Changing cube root of X to X to the one third. All right, so I'm gonna add one to that, which makes it four thirds. And I'm gonna divide by four thirds, which makes it three fourths. Seven came from the linear function seven X. Minus 11 X becomes minus 11 X squared over two. That becomes uh, X to the three halves plus two halves, five halves. Dividing by five halves is multiplying by two fifths and two fifths times the four that's already there, eight fifths plus C because it's an indefinite integral. So hopefully you just got a little mechanical practice there. Play the video again if you want to go more slowly. Uh, 
Uh, we got left hand rectangles. Okay, I want to concentrate on one more thing, and that'll be the end of our practice for tonight. I want to look at the derivative of y equals the square root of x, and we will change it into x to the one half. So we know the derivative of that is one half x to the minus one half. Okay? We're not going to use this too much. We're going to use a different format. So what does that mean, x to the minus one half? That means the square root of x is in the denominator. So therefore, we end up with one over two with the square root of x in the denominator. This is what I want you to memorize going forward, right? especially when we start working with the chain rule. This is awkward. This is easier to work with with this calculation. All right, so what is the derivative of the square root of x? One over two root x. Now the chain rule, I'm gonna explain in the next video, but let me just say, what if we have y equals the square root of the sine of x? Okay, that's a, that's a, that's a whole, whole nother top, topic here. Well, the way you do this is actually pretty basic. Understanding the numerics of it, why it works, that's the hardest thing to teach in this course, right? And it took me 10 years of teaching AB before I finally unraveled what's going on here. And I did so using integration, all right? There's nothing out on the internet. Well, there is a guy out in California now that's starting to do that cubic slotting, that stuff, right? He's doing it with computer graphics. Bill Gates hired him and he's making a name for himself, something blue. You'd like it, you're in California and I think so his. His name is Blue as well. So you, you guys should get together. All right. So, uh, uh, but I think you understand the numerics of it through integration. We can't get there for weeks. All right. And very rarely do I even talk about it in a class. But the mechanics of it, it's pretty simple. All right. And here's a good example of it. So to get this derivative, you actually take the derivative of what's inside, which is the cosine function. And then you finish it off with two times what's inside. Okay, that's not gonna mean anything to you. It's not gonna mean any more than the ln of a plus the ln of b is the ln of ab. Unless you know what the ln function is, you know, you're not gonna get much out of that other than mechanically you did it correctly. Okay, but we gotta start somewhere. And so that's your first look at uh, applying the chain rule, which I will make a video on, I think, tonight and talk about in detail as much as possible for a half an hour um, because uh, we're going to be working with it extensively, integrating and differentiating. Uh, that's the nuts and bolts of the class, actually. So um, we'll get to it. So what did I basically do? I basically did y equals the square root of some function. And the derivative of that particular one is f prime of x divided by two times f of x. Why did I choose that? Because we could look at y equals the ln of some function. And what's the derivative of that gonna be? It's gonna be f prime of x over f of x. I'll explain why in the future. We could have looked at e to the f of x. What's the derivative of e to the f of x? It is itself times the derivative of f of x. All right. I actually have two minutes, so let me I try to explain what's going on here a little bit, and then I'll get into it in more detail. Let's say we had y equals x squared cubed, which we know is x to the sixth, and we know the answer to that derivative. It's six x to the fifth. Applying the chain rule, applying the chain rule, if we look at this as some function, to the third. Well, in order to calculate this, you'd have to put a number in, square it, and then cube it. The last thing you did was cube. What's the derivative of cubing? The derivative of the cubing process is three times something squared. What is that something? Well, in this case, it's a function, which was x squared. And then you have to multiply that times the way this function is changing. How is x squared changing? It's changing at that rate. If I do this out, I should get 6s to the fifth. If I don't, 
it's time to retire and let somebody take over the class. I hope I didn't do something stupid. Let me drink my coffee. I got one more minute for the half hour video. I'm gonna make you do it. That's 45 seconds from now. I'm gonna hit the red button. Okay, lift off. X squared squared is 3x to the fourth. What is 3x to the fourth times 2x? Better be 6x to the fifth it is. Woo! Lift off. Talk to you tomorrow.